This is increased plant structural diversity. I want you to look at this fennel. Look how structurally diverse it is. It's got all this stuff going on. It's got fractals on fractals. Here is another one, just like goldenrod. Look at the fennel aphids. They don't get on anything else. So here is another plant that I like to use. I season with fennel, I eat fennel, I use fennel in all of my tuna salads and chicken salads and salads and stuff like that. I've got bronze fennel, I've got regular fennel. Here's your C7 ladybug. Uh, there will be little tiny praying manids in here. There's all kinds of stuff. There's parasitic wasps crawling around in here. They'll attack, and you can see all these little aphids. They're just everywhere in here. Does the goldenrod wipe out because of the aphids? No. Does the fennel wipe out because of the aphids? No. You know, so those aphids are actually totally a plus. And then a point to make about farmscaping is that if you're trying to make money or if you just want to have more things you can use, all the farmscaping is multifunctional. The day a chef asks you if you can provide fennel pollen is the day you got to do your math. Because you can provide it, but can you make money doing it? No way. But what you can do is say, I'll bring you fennel flowers. I'll make sure there aren't any bugs on it. And you just take that, those flowers and tap them over your food. And so all of a sudden now you can sell them flowers for a pretty good price. And they've got the freshest fennel pollen there is. And nobody had to collect it. It happens with all kinds of things that we use for farmscaping. Right. There's other uses. I do. All of my pickling spices are my farmscaping. Dill, garlic. I have a grape arbor because I use grape leaves. So see all this stuff, it just, once you begin, what'll happen is you'll develop your own personal relation with your land, listening to what it says, coming back, this didn't work, but this does. So something that may work right here at Living Webs, two hollers over. You start with the formula, but the ultimate formula is what you observe. You know, it's what your feedback is and what your needs are, and it changes every year. You know, it changes because of your predilections, it changes because of the weather. It's just always changing. And all you do is tweak. You're never coming in and like wiping the slate clean and planting it all over again. You're just tweaking it. Right. So you've got this type of system here where not only do we want multiple plants, but some plants have these great multiple functions where they bring in, you know, when I think of fennel, oh, you know, oh, beneficials all over that plant, okay? So that becomes really, really important. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is the one I was talking. So I get here last night, about 10. Patrick and I, of course, jabber till almost <laughs> one. I wanna show him this picture, all right? Cause here's what I was telling you about. I'm working with these parasitic wasps that attack cabbage caterpillars, okay? Here's a cluster of those cocoons. There's about 30 of these cocoons. And this was probably a side shoot. Cause some of these also, you notice we let them bloom. We let them go all the way through. And that's crazy too, because a lot of people won't do that, but we do because it allows, you won't believe the, the bees and stuff that come to broccoli flowers. Well, I mean, ones that lay their eggs in the pest tend to like to feed on the same plants, right. you know? So I'm taking a picture of this and I start to look at this picture and then I notice down here, here's another whole cluster of parasitic wasp cocoons that I didn't even notice before. So what we would do with these type of stalks is we would take them and put them on the edge of the field and when the wasps come out, the, the ends of these things pop open. It's like a little lid. So then we could look at these, and then it was time to till them under because all of our natural enemies are out of them. Boom, we're, we're done, okay? So this becomes really important. Yarrow and comfrey, I would be really careful with comfrey, but those are good overwintering plants. So you have that whole cycle that you are trying to complete here. Okay, so we're looking at plant structural diversity with overwintering. Don't be too afraid of comfrey, just don't dig it up without thinking. Yeah, what happened in my neck of the woods is they, we had comfrey in a, in a community garden and somebody got the smart idea to till it. That's called comfrey propagation. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, there's comfrey everywhere. And that's a lesson too, right? I mean, you can put some stuff in that you better be careful about too because it can overwhelm your system if you're not careful. Remember, you want more plant diversity. You want to stack and pack. So you really want the right plants. You want them available, and you want them over a long period of time. And you don't want the beneficials to have to travel very far. That comes in a little bit later. Here's this deep thought that we have, which is lots of clumps of these little plants is better than one big clump. 
literally, I've had you know, people say, can't do farmscaping because I need to put 20% of my farm to farmscaping. It's like nowhere near and a whole lot of what you're farmscaping in is, is your ditches and your edges and the plants that didn't make it. You know, or what we'll do is literally, we got a bunch of farmscaping plants right now. People go out to plant, they'll bring a handful of farmscaping plants. They'll just decide, okay, I'm not going to put a plant here and they poke a farmscaping plant in. And that's all they do. And sometimes the farmscaping plant is a little bit of your crop. You just let the crop go to seed. So your lettuce, your broccoli, your onions, all those things, almost every crop. Carrots, you just let them go to seed. Right. That was your farmscaping crop. You have a plump of yarrow and a right. plump of comfrey, but you right. have um, this mix. You have a mix and the clumps are separated out. Yeah. It's a clumps of the mix. Right, because what we, what we began to realize is if you are a parasitic wasp and you're this big, for me to fly to you is going to take a while. Where you and I would just think, well, that's not very far. I just walked three steps, right? Well, here's what happened. Back in the 90s when the gene jockeys started looking at all these genetic populations, the biocontrol guys got the gene jockeys. So we would have a field here that had the aphid parasite in it, aphidolites, right? They would do a DNA on that one. We'd go down the road a half a mile to another population of aphidolites, and they're genetically separated populations, a half a mile. But they're only this big. How far can they fly, right? They don't normally fly very far. And how well are they going to do if they don't have water during a hot time of year? You know, so you need to have that with those water go. features too. Right. So this whole thing, once again, this was, this was a takeout row at Jake's farm where they could bring the wagon through basically to haul all this garlic out. So I'm just like, well, well, you don't need it as a road. Or they even have a farmscaping mix called road show. So it's specifically meant to be driven over. It, it tolerates tractor tire. Yeah. The farm roads are part of the farmscaping. The farm ditches are part of the farmscaping. You know? Everything is part of the farmscaping. Think three-dimensionally in all different, you know, stack and pack. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides. Because if you don't have a mated female wasp, she lays male eggs. And we know what happens to male populations. You can ask the shakers. They're all gone. This is the important thing right here. This is your disco or your state line tavern. So you've got a mating pair here, and you've also got this other male that's trying to knock this other guy out of the way. Okay, for parasitic wasps, they mate at their floral resources. If you don't have these floral resources, you have a female wasp that's not mated, she'll lay male eggs. The other thing that's really cool about these wasps, they can selectively fertilize the egg that they're gonna put out. So if they come across a really lousy caterpillar, they're like, he's pretty loud, I'm just gonna put a male egg in him. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. Why do they do that? Why? Because if the female comes across a really big, nice, fat caterpillar, she's going to put a female egg. She'll selectively fertilize that egg, and then... I mean, why would she lay male eggs? She's not going to waste that resource, but that resource is not good enough to put a female in. She's got plan B, right. And you've got to have the male, too, you know. The female to be really healthy. The male just needs to get some sperm donated, and it's done. Let me tell you what happens with these male wasps. You saw the cocoons earlier. This is the wasp that comes out of those cocoons that were on that stalk. The males come out about a week before the female, and the first thing they do, they fly to a floral source like this, and they fight over it. Then the females come out, right? And the females want to go to the best floral source, which is where the best males are, because the best males have already fought it out. So she comes in. She's getting mated with the best male that's knocked all the, and they don't really hurt each other. They just knock each other, you know, it's like frogs. You know how frogs do? They get in the pond and they push each other and finally one frog's stronger than the other and he pushes that male away and that male's like, I'm done. But the female with that frog that was there, she comes and lays her eggs and then he fertilizes them. That female had a meal before she made it. That's right. And it's all right here. So this is your critical disco unit, all right? Now, this can be happening in the daytime. This can happen at night. This can happen right next to the ground, or it can happen 50 feet up in the air, depending on the insect, right? So if you have tiffia wasps, we want to have tulip poplar trees because they like to mate when the tulip poplars are blooming. When they mate, the male and the female tiffia lock up 
and they, they fly around and they look like a lightning bug. So you can look out and I can say, those are Tiffia vernalis and they're mating. Of course, I'm a geek about that stuff too. Once again, I'm just gonna continue to say this, it is so important to have a properly fed mated female if you are going to continue the web of life in your farm. It wouldn't work if you didn't have that 300 eggs but only had 30. And then if they were all male, there's just no way it's gonna work. That's what happens with this big difference between somebody like Kenny Haynes that's sitting there and knows what he's doing and he's sitting there and doesn't even say anything to all these conventional guys that are sitting there struggling for an hour and then finally in the group, they turn to Kenny. <laughs> because he knows something those guys don't know and they may be starting to get it now. Let's go to the next slide. Here's your tulip poplar. The researchers back in the old days, one of the things that we ended up doing, and I've been to Japan and China and the Azores out in the middle of the Atlantic because of Japanese beetle. The Department of Defense introduced the Japanese beetle into the Azores Islands accidentally. Now, through probably the nursery trade, I'm not exactly sure how, but they trapped 10 million Japanese beetles in 2017 in Northern Italy. It's there big time. If it's in Northern Italy, that also means it's in the Netherlands. I'm gonna tell you right now because the floral traffic between the Netherlands and Northern Italy is crazy. Right over the border in Switzerland, they built a big lab specifically to deal with Japanese beetle. Here is a tulip poplar blossom and these are called teeples. And one blossom of this can have a quarter cup of nectar. When the limbs are hanging down and low, you can just take and drink these things. Oh, it's so good. Here's a tree to have next to your garden or have a tree out in your woodlot. This is a great one. It makes good honey. The bees work it like crazy. The flowers are beautiful. I love these little orange spikes. It's just this beautiful flame and you're looking at the inner chakra of this tree. It's beautiful. I love that stuff. I love flowers like that. Turns out willows have extra floral nectaries. Right. You know, I mean, they're just like, and willows are also one of the very first things to flower. So they're feeding the very first beneficials that are out there. The very first pests too. And it's okay. Feed them all. Get the system going. It'll work itself out. Here I am in China. And I meet these Chinese at the International Congress of Entomology in 1992, Professor Yixing Luo and Professor Zhang, and then my buddy, Hung Yin Chen. He and I are like this, just like him and me. I go to this thing, they're using food plants to control white grubs in peanuts. And it is phenomenal. I go to these guys and I say, how did you figure this out? They said, we read your old USDA publications. You're not a very good scientist. That's the other part I gotta tell you, because they geeked me right there. And, and Hung Yin's my translator, and he's going down, and he's going, oh, Professor Lo has said something bad about you. <laughs> and I said, you can tell me what he said. And you know, and, and they're looking, and, and he said, he's, he thinks you're not a very good scientist. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I can learn more from him. So anyway, what these guys were doing they're using several different plants. The main money crop for them was peanuts. So they have these big, huge fields that go out. And I just wanted to show you a corner of it because they had planted the edges of this all the way around with canaf because it's a hibiscus. But the important thing was the tiffia wasp that stung the grubs in the ground would use the extra floral nectaries of this, okay? So every canaf plant, which looks a lot like cannabis, has two extra floral nectaries at the base of the leaves. What are you guys using? They're using peonies, sweet potatoes, canaf, bachelor buttons, okay? When you guys are thinking about this, don't only just think of blossoms. A lot of these plants, willows, peaches, Peaches have extra floral nectaries right at the base of each. That's why, the, you know, when you get a peach tree, you've got all these ants crawling on peach trees, carpenter ants, everything all the time. So not only is it happening here, but boy, the Chinese retaught us the stuff that we forgot. And then I was able to go back to my whole Japanese beetle group and go, oh my God, we need to go back, get publication number 1429, which by the way, we can load all those on your site because they're on PDF and I've got them and we'll put them all out. So. We've got extra floral nectaries. We have the flowers that are doing the nectar. One of the most important things is pollen. And Patrick had mentioned this earlier about fennel. 
a lot of beneficials will not even lay eggs unless they can eat pollen. So surfid flies here on Cosmos, right? So here's our flower. You know, the crazy thing about most of this is you sell your flowers faster than you sell your vegetables and it always irks me. The other crazy thing is that they have sunflowers that don't have pollen. <laughs> That's not. Because it might stain a tablecloth, you know? That's one of the things I wanted to ask is that when you're shopping for seeds, like a lot of the improved varieties for cut flowers they don't have enough, are yeah. not going to be good for them. They're not improved. And all those big old double flowers are not going to be... You can just see the activity, right? Yeah, it's not nearly as much. It's right. true. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you got to, I mean, you're going to need to sell those too, but you can mix the other ones in. And they can be filler too, right? You don't have to have just the big gorgeous ones. You know, you can have the pollen ones in too. Um, you can want that pollen, you know. Years ago, I bought Aureus insidiosus, the minute pirate bug, for a thrip problem in our daylilies at the Highland Lake Inn because they fed the daylilies to the customers and there were a bunch of thrips in there. And Jim Klutz loved to hike. It was the 4th of July weekend. You didn't get them off in time. By the time they got to me, the thrips were gone. I called him up and said, what am I going to do? I got the Aureus insidiosus, which wasn't a cheap bug to buy. No. And $80. Didn't have, and that was $80 in 1994, you know. Um, and he says, well, do you have anything in bloom that's got pollen? I said, well, how about sunflowers? He says, you got no problem. <laughs> when I was biocontrol administrator and Tony Cleese was teaching uh, at Carolina Community College, and Robin Kohanovich is in that position now, for two years we went there and they had this big corn patch and we had no minute pirate bug that he's talking about, Aureus insidiosus. So for two years we swept, didn't find them. So the third year they spent $160 because they bought two of those $80, $80 bottles of have 500 pirate bugs in them. We dumped them out. They loved the corn. They were in there and they were eating the corn earworm eggs off the silk. From every year after that, we had them there. So a lot of times, if that biology isn't there, you can buy it, bring it in, and then it's yours. If you understand the requisites for a surfeit fly are big, fuzzy flowers like this. The other one I've gotten recently, they're not normally a flowering plant like this that has big pollen, but there's a variety that does. I just had stuff all over it. I'll think of the plant in a minute. We want plants that have aphids on them. I love aphids. We want plants that have aphids. We want plants that have soft-bodied insects. So he's calling me up and he's going, oh, I've got subterranean clover and it's just got aphids all over and it's just great. You know what I mean? And if you said that to a normal person, they would be going, oh, you know, you need to nuke that. They were dahlias, okay? Right, yeah. And most dahlias are those, uh, you know, most of those ornamental ones that have the big fuzzy leaves. Well, this dahlia looks like this. It was just kind of freaky, so we bought it and put it in the garden. And the next thing you knew, I have a movie of monarch butterflies on that plant. And the opportunities are always there. We're making a compost pile, and Jeremy said, I got some big piles of weeds you can come get for the compost pile. So I went and took the fork, and I lift these weeds off, and what do I have left? This gorgeous bare ground, right? And so I gave Jeremy a call and said, you know, those two spots that I just cleaned out, perfect place to sow poppies. I said, great idea. Poppies? Tons of pollen on them, just tons of them. And they're, how, they're so fast, and they just make you happy as all heck to see. And all you do is throw the seed down, and they pop up and grow. And those opportunities are everywhere all the time. With every insect or with every organism, there is a cork. So if you look at this guy here, here's your surface, here's your hoverflies. There's about 10 different varieties that we have here at least. They have to have pollen to lay eggs. If they don't get pollen, no eggs those critical tipping points that if you recognize you don't have the normal insects, you have biodynamic organic super insects that actually do more than the regular ones. So, you know, it, it's almost like the food. I, I can tell you, you know, if I have to taste organic tomatoes, I can tell you an organic tomato over a conventional one. We used to do those taste tests all the time. So right away, the first thing we're thinking about is whatever our pest is, we're gonna make a table like this that goes out and lays out each life stage of the pest. Then the beneficials. Then what we wanna know about that beneficial, is that a high dispersing beneficial? Is it a medium dispersing beneficial or a low dispersing beneficial? So if I'm using these little parasitic wasps, 
their whole life is gonna take place in an area no bigger than this room, and that's immense to them to begin with. You know what I mean? Their whole life may not be more than this whole tabletop. So if you have these low dispersion ones, it's almost by size, but some of them, you've got ground beetles, crabids, they'll, they like to stay. They'll stay right in an area, and you need a log or something for them to hide under, okay? Lady beetles, we've got six or seven species of lady beetles. We can go to a website and walk through all those in a little bit. The smaller parasitic wasps, the aphidolides, the ones that attack aphids, and also the little coatsia wasps, they're, they're fairly small. Most of the coatsia wasps and these little braconid wasps that attack caterpillars are actually this size. They're, they forage. I'm kind of breaking this into what would stay in, quote unquote, your field versus something that would fly as much as a quarter mile, would fly you know, to the neighbor's house over there. So those are the most of those little parasitic wasps. Paper wasps, that's about as far as they go, and predatory bugs. Now, when you get into these bugs that look like helicopters, you know they cruise, right? So you know when you look at a dragonfly or these tachinid flies or surfids, when you can watch these things fly, and this thing can fly from here to that corner in two seconds, voo. If I'm in my holler on a day like today in the afternoon when the sun's hitting it right, as the sun's setting and it's coming across my holler, there are millions of insects out. There's a, there's a swarm. There's another one where all these ones are going zooming by. And if you actually, I mean, there's thousands upon thousands. So that's the neat thing that you see when you have the ability to look out and see this big mass of insects flying around is then you have an idea that something is working. For most people, if you don't, if you're not an expert in parasitic wasps like me and you don't know how to use insect keys, that doesn't matter. Because what you want to do is focus on ladybugs. You can see ladybugs, you can see the larva, you know what the eggs look like. If ladybugs are doing good, everybody else is doing pretty good. All right, just to start with. And then if you get geeky later on, then we'll get into you know, wasp 101 and wasp 201 and postdoc wasp, we can do all that stuff. How to dream like a wasp, I, I, I dream like wasps. And notice this here, this is the important point again, remember, so here's the big summary. You're gonna have a diversity of plants, you're gonna spread them out, right? You're gonna have your floral resources available over a longer period of time, and you don't want these things, I don't wanna have to drive into Asheville to go eat, I wanna eat in this room today right, so we can get stuff done. If that beneficial has to spend half of its day flying halfway across the field to go to that tulip poplar tree, and then has to spend the other half of the day coming back, it's not gonna do very well. If it's gotta wait until the next morning to get a drink of dew, because it can't make it to the- It's gonna tomorrow. just hide and shut down for the rest it's of the day. It's not be doing its job all day long, whereas if there's something like a cup plant that has this little reservoir of water all day long, then that little tiny flyer gets to have a drink of water and goes out looking for love. You want these insects to realize their genetic potential. Just like we want us to realize our spiritual and genetic potential as, as human beings, to be here with good intent, trying to do the right thing. Notice I have this one in white because now I want you to wake up. We're getting further and deeper into the farmscaping. This is where it gets really weird because you can do things like entrainment. So let me tell you a really quick story. A guy named Joe Lewis, I'm in an entomology meeting, national meeting, Entomological Society of America meeting in Atlanta. I'm in a room with about 50 people. Joe Lewis walks in. He's got a little jar. Okay, so he's got a jar like this. And he sets this jar down. He goes, in this jar are the parasitic wasps that I was showing you earlier Except what he did, he would take the female wasps and he would paint caterpillars with vanilla. So the, these are virgin female wasps and they learn, they're smart. They're females, they're smart, they learn. They would go out and they'd sting that caterpillar and they would realize that vanilla was associated with this. So Joe would say, where do you want me to paint the vanilla in the room? You know what I mean? So all these ento geeks are going, oh, whoa, whoa, put it on the wall over here. So Joe comes over, takes some vanilla. He paints it on the wall. He comes back and he goes, now, 
while I'm giving my talk, I'm going to open this jar up and I want you to watch what these wasps do. This is the greatest. This is like a Larson cartoon. You can just imagine everybody in there with their duck, right? You know? So he opens up this lid and, no, and people are watching him, but at the same time, they're just watching these wasps because these wasps come up. Next thing you know, they're flying around. Pretty soon they're starting to go this way. By the end of the talk, all of his wasps are sitting over on that vanilla. He goes over to the aspirator, picks them all back up again, puts them in his thing, and he's done with his talk. All right. This female learns to associate mustard oil with the natural enemies. And the caterpillars, when they feed, the plants are screaming for help, by the way. The plants are giving off this mustard oil because the wasps will smell it. And then the wasps come in and get these guys. If the system's set up, it's just beautiful. The plant can call for help. The wasps know it. The wasps, when they're out searching around, they're like, where's the mustard oil? Because that's where the damage is. Boom! They're on, that, they're on that, that caterpillar. Of course, the pest also found it because of the mustard oil. Right. <laughs> In that idea, I mean, everything wants to survive. Right. So how is the mustard plant helping itself survive? It is preventing damage to it to the point where it can reproduce. The real important thing to know is that they now know the plants that have been predated on, the plant responds with antioxidants. And so the food that we have grown that has insect holes is better for us. Yeah, and that's what's really crazy. Like with broccoli, once again, because we did so much commercial work with broccoli, broccoli could take 50% defoliation up to the time that it would button, and it would actually increase the yield. Your yield would increase because you're stimulating that plant. Plant's not just sitting around. All of a sudden it's like, oh, so I think four years ago or so ago, I got asked to give a talk at a broccoli meeting out in, out in Waynesville. And somebody gave that quote, said Richard said it, and they said, but I can't ask a farmer to do that. And I raised my hand and said, I do it. I do it. I can show you the pictures. You know, I can show you the pictures of every beneficial in the world because I let that much damage happen. And guess what? My broccoli heads were huge. You know? It does work. You can do it. You know? But you can then make the mistake of thinking you could do that with cross type cabbage worm and your toast, because they just gather up in such numbers that they take it down. Yeah, they're gregarious. You know, when, a, when, a, when you get cross-striped cabbage worm, if you got one of them, you got 20 of them, and they're making a web, and you got cabbage web worm, and southern... And the lesson is that every rule has its exception, and you have to keep learning, and you can't just go, I had faith, I had faith, it had to work. There were all these parasitized worms, I knew it was going to work. Too late, you know? Right. Too, I, didn't, I didn't allow for how quickly that 50% could be supersede it and become 75%, which is about where, where I sprayed the BT. You know. So tuning in, I would release these parasitic wasps and I would put them in a gelatin capsule and I'd take the female and put her over a little first or second instar imported cabbage worm, let her sting it and then pull the capsule away and she'll stay. If you just open it up, let it go, she's gonna fly. She'll fly till she calms down. But if you take them and put them on there, then, you know, then suddenly I've entrained her. She suddenly, you know, all of a sudden she's like, whoa, there's food here. The other thing that happens is after they sting a, a caterpillar, just as most females, they clean themselves. They do a fixed action pattern where they clean themselves off. I think it's really cool because I could come across one and it's sitting by a caterpillar and if she's cleaning herself off, she's already stunned. These systems fail because they are biological systems and I'm not going to come here and tell you that we've figured everything out and we now know everything. So the other thing to think about are the two extremes or the extremes that you have to deal with. And these are, I'm noticing in my area now, we're getting stronger and stronger wind gusts that are knocking over big trees. We're getting more flooding or more erratic. You've got drought stress. So some of these systems, if you take this here is an okra seedling and there's actually ants on here. I clipped the ant out of the picture, but there's ants on here. So these systems can fail. If you wait till you have a pest problem like this, I'm gonna tell you to use soap, okay? So a lot of the other things that we have on the table back there and a lot of things that we have are support. They're least toxic solutions that help to support our biological system. So if we have a problem like this, I'm not gonna go spray something really nasty that kills everything. I might spray soap because I want to kill what is in this area, and that's it. I might spray surround, and that'll just make these bugs really unhappy, 
and they just won't boom, they won't thrive. I deny them the chance to thrive. They don't right. get to blossom. They'll be there, but they'll be at a level where the beneficial can come in a little later and start to catch up with them. Right. We've got diatomaceous earth. We have a bunch of these examples over here. After this, we'll, we'll try to go through a few of the, of the, the things that we use. Here is 72,000 hippodamia convergence lady beetles, and I'm putting this out on three acres of broccoli. This is Jewel Moros. So once again, these, this is Patrick's quote here. Hold your fire if possible. You don't always, I mean, a lot of people are very, very trigger happy, right? We'll get back to what my famous quote is. I didn't know what it was, so I killed it. I mean, I've had people tell me, I just killed 40 potato beetle larvae on my broccoli. It's like, guess what? You just killed 40 ladybug pupa on your broccoli. Brad was squishing the cocoons on broccoli. He comes up and he goes, these are Mexican bean beetle eggs. And I'm going, Brad, <laughs> those are wasp cocoons. Stop squishing them, ah! Right? So here's the other thing, and this was one of uh, Everett Dietrich's back in that 1969 five points that I mentioned way earlier that we'll put on the website. You've got to have some pest residue. We call it pest residue in entomology. Because if you're going to think in absolute clean terms that you cannot have one of that pest, you're in for a big problem. Because most, if you think about conventional ag, and I grew up in conventional ag, we always loved those absolutes. We wanted clean fence rows. We didn't use soil. Soil was a medium for us to get the fertilizer into the corn. All right? We would put lasso out first so that when I'm checking these rows for where there's skips, the soil is burning my hand. My hand swells up like Hellboy. I have a hand that looks like a lobster claw by noon. The manager comes to bring me lunch. I go, Don, look at my hand. He goes, just switch hands. <laughs> I go, no, Don, that is not a good answer. You know, my hand swollen up. It looks like, you know, you've blown a balloon, you know, one of those latex gloves. It's, it's that big. Those are the kinds of things that a lot of us went through back in conventional ag where we had some kind of transitional event that bumped us into organic. We got poisoned too many times. You know, there's, there's a lot of that. So, once again, instead of that system, instead of prescription chemistry, you know, there's a problem and there's a chemical for that solution. We have a whole systems approach that has modularity in it where these different systems automatically combine into their own layer and begin to work. It's just so neat to put it together and just watch it work. So once again, you know, we try to stay away from broad spectrum pesticides. The trick with these ladybugs here is, is, is a couple fold. We would, I would sprinkle one or two ladybugs over, it took me hours to put these ladybugs out because I did it right. I opened this up just for the picture, but what I would do is keep that closed and I would bring it out and I'd have a little thing of Excelsior that had maybe 20, one there, one there, one there. That way when I got done, I came back a week later, they're in there, none of them have left. And the other thing that was in there was all this lamb's quarter and there was a little bit of hairy gallinsoga that I hate, that buffalo clover. I, you know, I mean, boy, that's... You gotta a, start eating it. I know. <laughs> but, but you know what that's I mean, back in the day. Staple. Right. Well, and same thing, he, yeah. he gave me this purple lamb's quarter. I got purple lamb's quarter. I use it like spinach now. It's in my garden. It's a culinary variety. But you see, so in other words, what, here's what most people would do. They would buy a gallon of these ladybugs. They'd go out in the middle of their field, take them and shake them out like this, right? And walk away. Well, if you take 72,000 people and dump them in this room, what are you gonna do? I'm going out that window. <laughs> You're gonna get as far away as possible. What happens when these things are crowded like this, their first thing they wanna do, the minute I'm out of this bag, I'm flying five miles, man. I'm just gonna fly five miles. You take them and sprinkle them out. The other thing that we would do, we'd use 10% sugar. It's a, one of the very good reasons. I use actual white sugar every once in a while. It's white death, but I only use it to, to keep these guys around. I'll go out and spray an area with a little bit of 10% sugar water. You sprinkle these guys out, they hit that, they think it's aphid honeydew. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, there's sugar, there's aphids here. So they will stay. So here's the other thing that would happen. You guys would love this. I saw this happen. Patrick goes to a meeting with David Orr 
And uh, folks at NCSU will never say ladybugs are any good and they still won't say they're good. But we got David to go to this point. He said, I understand that Patrick understands enough about ladybugs that he can actually make them work. <laughs> but, it, but you know what I mean, so it's only him in all the whole, it, there's only one person that can do this in the whole state. The scientists can't do it, right? I mean, I'm a PhD, right? I'm smarter than him. <laughs> Come on, I got a degree from Virginia Tech. You know? No. Everybody in here has a PhD. We all have a PhD in different things. We are all here to give each other our own little gift of how we see the world. That's been the greatest thing that's, that he's been able to do for me is he was an Ento geek and he was just an original Ento geek. He didn't even need to go to school. Me, on the other hand, I, you know, I, I went, I did it their way. But, but I then I broke out. I wanted to know the science too. I mean, the science is exciting, you know? If you can take a reductionist thing and use it to incorporate it into a whole thing, it's great. If you're gonna take a reductionist thing and just leave it out there by itself, then it ain't, doesn't work, all right? So let's go on, that's the next one. Hold your fire. This is our mantra. If I sit down and I can't figure out whether or not I am going to do something, this is Patrick's operating system. Patrick goes, is it going to add to the diversity? Will it add to the complexity? If so, I'm probably going to put it in. If it's going to take away from my diversity or mess my system up or it's some plant that has an allelopathic property, I'm not gonna be planting walnut trees in my tomato patch. Okay, here's the perfect example. Yesterday, Jeremy kind of apologized to me because he was starting marigolds. Marigolds have this like, like aura of being the beneficial insect plant, about one of the worst beneficial plants, insect plants you can get. They stink, right? No bugs wanna go eat there, you know? The theory is they're gonna stink so bad that the bugs won't find the plants. They have pyrethrum in them. They have natural, py I mean, that's where pyrethrum comes from. It was from chrysanthemums. And so Jeremy's apologizing to me for starting, um, not really, but kind of like, oh, you know, Michelle really wants me. It's like, we can also just grow things because we like them. It's okay. It's not like you can't have marigolds, but don't fool yourself that it's your farmscaping plant, you know? Right. Um, know when you're doing something for your diversity and when you're doing something just because it makes you happy, you know? And someday we're going to find out that there's something the marigolds do too. Everything does something. I gave this talk in September, so in here I put down the Source Farm people. I don't know. Anyway, this is a really cool group that should be actually connected to you guys because these guys are trying to do in Jamaica what you guys are doing here. This is a Patrick paragraph. This is, when you're putting this together, remember this is an entire web. It's not just the beneficials that you're looking at. There are beneficials in the soil. There's decomposers. There's there's insects that fight other insects that don't kill them, but they push them out of the way. You know, they're an antagonist. So if an aphid lands somewhere and there's a stink bug or something there, they'll go, I can't do this here. They're gone. So there's all these little tricks. Mother Nature has a million tricks we haven't discovered and a million more after that. So part of this for us is just the joy of discovery and sharing in the living web of nature with you guys and, and you guys teaching us. Because I'm standing up here, you know, blowing gums, but the way that I learned all this was to shut up and listen to people like Patrick and listen to people like each of you who would come up to me and say, hey, I found soldier flies in blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? So that, it's that kind of, of system. This is one of the biggest trees I've ever seen. This is a rain tree at Churchill's farm in Jamaica. It is, I mean, here's his house. So you can see the size of this tree. So this is the future, reach out and grab it, okay? Thank you guys so much for bearing with us on our farmscaping part of this. We got that down, we're gonna take a break now. Coffee and Meredith makes scones. It smells so good. Yeah. <laughs>